every year we get to this point and uh and there's that certain tension stress how am i doing as a a husband boyfriend girlfriend wife single that single being single during valentine's it's a certain pressure tension that we put on ourselves that we really don't need to I entitled this message when my wife saw it as she because she does the PowerPoint. She said, Why you call that that? And I said, Well, I just need to go ahead and say it. It's called a pre Valentine headache. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I can get real serious about certain things. Yesterday I did a funeral of a young friend of mine who was fifty one years old. I have serious moments, but every now and then I just need a moment to laugh and have a little levity. And there's nothing funnier to me than romance. <laughs> romance has a has a uh, uh, an expiration date, according to men. It's right after they say I do. I know, I know, I know. It's not supposed to be that way, is it? But I, I just uh, I just want to try to share as much truth as I can and let you know that uh, you know, this has never been a, a spot in my life where I've been really good at. So uh, as I walk through this, I want to stick as close to the Bible as I can for a road map here. All right? Uh, you know, the word, I love this word. I learned it in college, and I've just never got away from it. The word is koinonia. It's the Greek word for fellowship. It's what happened yesterday when when... All those men got together in the fellowship hall, and we had a, a wonderful breakfast served by some wonderful ladies, and then, and then we began to share the word with each other. It means fellowship, that which is in common, communion, sharing a social or fraternal organization. I got a phone call that some of the brothers wanted to ride motorcycles to church from the New Caney North Campus to here. So I thought, well, I'll join in. It's just a couple of guys. Well, by the time we got here, there were 10 bikes that rode over here in 38-degree weather. That was koinonia. That was fellowship in common. Because when we got here, we were all cold together. We had a commonality, if you would. It's, it's not to be unequally yoked in marriage, business, or society because it is incompatible in the fellowship with the Father. Koinonia in the early church is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. It says, And now, brothers... We want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the saints. In other words, this church had a what would be considered poverty level, and yet they were givers, and they gave to the saints. They wanted to be connected with that koinonia, and they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. The word koinonia, that heavenly love which fills the hearts of the believers one for another. It was koinonia that uh, you may not even be familiar with the word, but that's what happened in your life that caused you to forgive people. It was coin on it. When you got when you got born again, you got that in your life. It was that fellowship. When you heard somebody use the word brother or sister, you realized you were connected to them because we have the same father. Can I get an amen? amen. Now we get into this month of February, and, and February's been tagged so many different things. Uh, uh, people grab the month and use it as a as a, as a, uh, a badge of honor for whatever um, they they are. But it, it's it's that romantic month because of. The, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Valentine, the heart, romance. When I was a young boy, and I'm talking nine, ten years old, I fell in love with a young girl who was, her name was Sherry. And I've never told this story that I can believe, but I was thinking back to my early romantic days, and I thought, well, I, I need to be romantic. And I need to do something to let her know I was affectionate toward her. I've never touched her hand, sat near her. I just saw her across the classroom. And I thought, she's cute. And I'm, again, I'm probably eight, nine years old. And I got a matchbox. 
my, my parents were smokers, and so I had a, a, a matchbox, and I took it, and I remember I saved up two pieces of dentine gum and put in there, and I put in some dimes and nickels that I had saved from picking cotton, and, uh, and I pushed it in that little box, and I gave it to her. It was a romantic gesture that never had a return. <laughs> We've all done something similar to try to uh, coax in the opposite sex. Romance in the Webster Dictionary is a fictitious tale of wonderful and extraordinary events characterized by much imagination and idealization without basis in fact and exaggeration or falsehood. Let me say that again. Romance is a fictitious tale of wonderful and extraordinary events. You come up and you try to get this fairy tale idea that everything's going to fall in place, everything's going to be great, characterized by much imagination and idealization without the basis, in fact, an exaggeration of falsehood. In opposite, love, in the Vines Dictionary, is whether exercised toward the brothers or toward men generally is not an impulse from the feelings. It does not always run with the natural inclinations, nor does it spend itself only upon those for whom some closeness is discovered. In other words, it's okay for me to put my arm around a brother and sister and say, I love you. I don't have to have an emotional feeling toward that. I love you based on my commitment in Christ toward you. Everybody follow that? So romance deals in a fantasy rather than reality. Romance is gourmet meals and candlelight, and, and, uh, and I'm not against it. Hey, if you can get it, go for it. But I'm telling you, that's not always uh, reality. Amen. Romance deals with settings, you know, that the weather is right, the mood is right, the expectations are right. It depends on everything but commitment. Love, on the other hand, depends on nothing but commitment. Amen. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, not on the overhead, but in my Bible here. 1 Corinthians 13 is a picture of Jesus. If, you, if I could just draw words and let you see Jesus, this is him. He is kind. He is patient. He does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. Jesus is not rude. Uh, he's not self-seeking. He's not easily angered. He keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love protects, trusts, hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. That's real love. And it's hard to twist people to get them to understand that this is what love is. It's not holding grudges. It's not being envious. It's not being jealous. It's being kind toward one another. Amen. This month, this is a good thing to practice. Walk into this kind of love. Can I get an amen? Amen. Romance, my friend, romance cannot handle the demands of real life. Romance, we, we can look for Ken and Barbie until we weigh each other down with unrealistic expectations. Beauty is a billion-dollar business. And though Ken and Barbie are both perfect, they're both perfectly plastic. They're not real. Reality is what we do for each other before marriage. Listen to me. What you do for each other before marriage is no indication of what's going to happen after marriage. Before marriage, we're carried along by the force of the in-love obsession. We fall in love. Most intermarriage by the way of the in-love contract. We meet someone whose physical characteristics and personality traits create enough electrical shock to trigger our love alert system. The bells go off. We set in motion the process of getting to know that person. We share a burger or whatever your budget is. We are on our quest to discover Love, one more time, could this warm, tingly feeling I have inside be the real thing? Then the tingle leaves on the second date when she blows her nose into a tissue and looks at it. When love is reciprocated, we start talking about marriage because everyone agrees that being in love is the most necessary foundation for a good marriage. Then we get high on love. Guys, we've been there. Don't, don't look around and act like that and what you three or four times. You know, and, and, and you gotta, and this is where, where reality starts hitting the road here. You know, when, when we get high on love, it's at its peak, it's, it is euphoric. 
God makes it that way for us. We are mostly obsessed with each other. We eat, sleep, think the other person. We long to be together. We hold hands. Our blood flows together. I, I, you know, as a youth pastor, I used to teach teenagers. I would watch teenagers all the time. Observe their behavior and realize that was me too. Some of you are right now, you're running back into your mind and you're remembering the day. Oh. That first time you held hands. Do you remember? Woohoo! I just, and it's, it's so funny the way we're thinking, and we don't want to do anything. Some people are really smooth. I, I never was smooth, but, but they're really smooth. It, you're walking down the mall together or, or in, a, in, a, in a store somewhere, and you, and you, you just had even, you, you've never really been close to each other, but you were thinking to yourself, I'd sure like to hold her hand. And she's thinking, why won't he hold my hand? And he's trying to get the nerve up, and he's swinging his hand back and forth. And you, you're swinging your hand, and you know, both know what you're doing. And at that moment, you just kind of strike knuckles and sparks fly. He has the urge to run to the restroom real quick. I mean, he just, it, just, it just comes all over him. He, just, he can't believe what just happened. You know, and it's that in love moment. And, 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 then, and then you get together and, and then you, 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 you're at a theater and you're watching a TV show or, or I mean, a movie. And, and then you slide that arm around him real slick, real slick, like, you know, trying to get shoulder to shoulder. And isn't it great that God made your armpit to fit her shoulder? The problem is when you're young, you're sweating under the arm and you stick. And every time she turns her head to the left, she smells. Do you remember all that? Does anyone remember? No, y'all don't remember none of that. Yeah, it's, it's a long past your life. You don't, you don't, don't remember that in love moment when all that happens. And, 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 and then this after the marriage, we revert to being the people we were before we fell in love. She thinks I can love him enough to change him. You can't love him enough to change him. Only God can change him. Amen. You know, it, our, our actions are influenced by the model of our parents, our own personalities, our perceptions of love, our emotions, our needs and desires. And then love bottoms out. Oh, it never happened to us, Pastor. That's great. I'm glad. That's good. Let me talk to the other 99% that aren't lying. Eventually... Reality hits. And this is where love really kicks in. Because it's about committing. Eventually, you descend from the clouds. Our feet touch the earth. Our eyes are open. We see the warts. We recognize some irritating personality traits. We didn't realize he was so much like his mother. <laughs> what, we, what we overlooked while in love now looks like mountains. People tend to criticize their spouse most loudly in the area where they themselves have the deepest emotional need. Their criticism is an ineffective way of pleading for love. Some will perform acts of service out of guilt or fear instead of love. No one should be treated as a doormat. If you want them to be a lover, then you have to love them. You've got to fill their emotions with the need they have. You've got to speak their language. I remember uh, 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 Tony Orlando and Don Cupid. Draw back your bow and let. Your hair will flow. You don't remember when you could call a radio station and, and, and ask for a, a, a request and you would send a request out to someone and it would be that song and you'd leave your name out for fear? Huh? You know what I'm talking about? But listen, when you study the, uh, this, any history, Cupid was the Roman god of sexual love. It's, you know, it's time to stop pressure. Uh, on people, when, you know, when you going to get married? Or, or you, you're getting pretty old to still be single, aren't you? Those are embarrassing, unnecessary questions to people. I, I, I found that marriage, my friend, is the second biggest commitment you're ever going to make once you commit yourself to Christ. And then marriage, I, I found that, that God, it's God's place to put people together. I remind men, he that finds a wife finds a good thing. Sir, you're not going to find her sitting there. You need to get hunting. You got to get moving. Sister, be still. Quit hunting yourself. You just stand up in the tower. Amen. Throw your hanky out the window and yell, Woohoo! That's all you need to do, sister. You ain't got to go hunting for him. You just stand up there and go, Woohoo! Amen. And he'll find you. 
He that's hunting for a wife will find a good thing. That's, that's what the scripture teaches us. Matthew 19, 11, Jesus replied, Not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For some are eunuchs because they were born that way. Others were made that way by men. And others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. There are times God actually calls people to be single. It's okay to be single and married to Jesus. Amen. Amen. You're waiting on that moment when God, if he does, if he doesn't, it's fine. You learn how to live with that. That's what he said. If you can accept that, accept that. I don't know where the scripture is right now. I'll find it for you later. But the Bible says if you want to avoid trouble, if you want to stay out of trouble, don't get married. If the Bible says that, why are you acting like you ain't never had no trouble in your marriage? Amen. Because it happens. It's two people coming together, trying to be compatible, trying to talk, trying to work through all this stuff. They, 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 they've made this moment. Listen, in life, what do you do? You walk with your feet on the ground, your eyes on him. If you're attracted to someone, talk to the father about them before you talk to your buddies about them. Remember, love can wait. Romance will never stand the test that love can. Real love seeks the welfare of others. Romans 5, 1. We who are strong ought to bear the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each, and I'm not telling you not to buy chocolates and flowers and all that for your husband. I'm just telling you to pay, pay attention a little bit more to love here. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor, for this is good, to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. So real love pleases others. It's not about yourself. Love works no ill to any. Romans 13, 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. What do you owe me to love me? What do I owe you to love you? That's the debt we have. Amen. This is powerful. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandment, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm, does do no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love seeks opportunity to do good. Seeks after it. I'm looking for an opportunity to be a blessing somewhere. Galatians 6.10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, uh, especially to those that belong to the household of faith. Amen. Especially to your brothers and your sisters around you. Amen. Do good to them. If you have opportunity to be a blessing, to be kind to someone, be a blessing to someone. I like the fact, now not the fact that Joseph and Schuyler broke down on their way here, but I like the fact they called a member of this church to go help them pick them up and another member called to make sure they can get their vehicle. That's household of faith stuff. That's what love does. Do you love me? That's what. How can you run with somebody for a few years and still ask the question? Jesus asked Peter after three years of running with him, John chapter 21, verse 3. John 21, when you see John 21, you realize it's after the resurrection. Jesus has already met with these guys a couple of times. And the scripture says, Peter speaking, I'm going out to fish, Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now let's back up in our minds a little. The first time we find Peter in a boat fishing, they caught nothing all night, correct? Then Jesus shows up on the shoreline, gets in the boat with Peter, And they catch uh, uh, so much fish that the boat almost capsizes. Then they get on shore, and then there's this three years. After three years, and you've heard me use this statement a lot. A man or a woman that has no future always reverts back to their past. If you don't have a future to go into, you always go back to what you know and what you came from. And Peter felt like at this moment he had no future. Jesus told him, from now on, you're going to catch men. Three years later, the failure started in Peter's life, and he realizes how important it is to stay in koinonia, to stay in relationship, to stay in love with Christ. And here at this moment, he gone fishing. All night long, they have caught nothing. Now, I'm a very impatient man when it comes to fishing. If you invite me fishing, we better catch something. If you know me, I'm telling the truth. I don't like going and just sitting for hours like David does and Ronnie does. 
I just can't. It's not, some, it's not in my DNA. I want to be catching. I guess I, I, if you want to invite me to go catching, I'll go catching with you. Fishing is another word. I understand the difference, okay? I just, I've just been that way. Now, all night long, they have not called nothing. They're professional fishermen. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. They're 100 yards away. Now, 100 yards away, you can imagine, it's the length of a football field. It looked like a little figurine down there. He can't tell. They can't tell who he is. So as he's standing there, he called out to them, Friends, got any fish? Now, you know as I do, you never have to ask a fisherman if he's caught anything. Because if he has, he will tell you. He has pictures, selfies, and everything else of the fish he just caught. He's learned how to hold the fish to make it look bigger in the picture. Uh-huh. Got any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat. You'll find some. Left side, boat. Right side. There's not six, seven feet distance here. But yet, I'm missing it, throwing it over here. But if I throw it over here, the fish are over here. So they throw their net on the right side of the boat. And they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. When the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, who was the disciple that Jesus loved? It's easy to know who it is. What book we're in? John. John said, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. Why you put your clothes on before you swim? Normally you take your clothes off and you get in the water. Unless you thought when John said, that's Jesus 100 yards away, you put your coat on thinking you're going to walk on the water again. So he jumps in. Now he got to swim because he can't walk on the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard, dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish. 153. How many fish you catch? 153. Why does that matter? Because numbers matter. 153. How much did that deer weigh? 180 pounds. With my foot on the scale. Huh? We we just that way, uh, ladies. I know that you you know more more specific, but men men we got to count. We got to tell you how how much it weighed, how many there was, how big a fight it put up, what kind of man I was trying to drag that in. One hundred and fifty three fish. They counted them up. That's a lot of fish. That's a lot of fish. A lot of cleaning. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, "Come and have breakfast." None of the disciples. This is the first. Men's meeting right here. Breakfast in the men. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Then they had finished eating. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, son of John, do you truly love me? And the word love there is the word agape, which means sacrificial more than anything else. You put me at the top. Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you, Jesus said. Feed my lambs. When Peter said, I love you, he's using the word filio, which we get our word Philadelphia, the city of friendly love, or the city of brotherly love. In other words, it would be like me saying to H.D., H.D., I love you, and H.D. looking back at me and saying, I like you too. David, I love you. Pastor, I like you too. What I'm looking for is the reciprocation of the word I just used. I wanted to come back. But Peter, in honesty now, 
Because now he's been caught fishing again when he said he wouldn't do it. He's realized the right side of the boat. If I listen to the instructions of my Savior, I'll have all I need. This is real love. 153 fish. Then he, Jesus looks at him and he says, Peter, do you love me? Uh, and, and, and he actually uses the term these. Do you love me more than these? What's he talking about? The other men that are with you? No, no, no. Do you love me more than these fish? Do you love me more than your occupation? Do you love me more than the things that you're running with in life? Do you love me more than your addiction to fish, to hunt, to drink, to drug? To, to, to uh, uh, fraternize with the opposite sex. Do you love me more than this? Well, you know, I like you. Hello? So you ask it again. Peter, do you love me? You know, I like you. Peter, do you love me? Well, you know, I like you. I, let me just say, I appreciate Peter not giving in to heavenly pressure here. Because a lot of us would say, you know we love you, and we'd be lying. But he was telling the truth. Uh, I, I tell you the truth. Then Jesus said to him, and this is what was the breakdown was. He wanted to tell Peter, Pete, this life is not going to go for you the way you think it's going to go. There's going to come a day where they're going to lead you where you don't want to go. Uh, I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself, and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you, and they'll lead you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. He left him with the same instruction that he met him with. Follow me. Just, just stay with me and follow me. The death of Peter, according to history, is that he died upside down, being crucified backwards, if you would, feeling himself not worthy. This man went on preaching the gospel. This man stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached. 3,000 got saved. Then 5,000 got saved. This is a man that was incarcerated for preaching the gospel, and yet Peter was not afraid to die because God had already given him a word. Have you ever got a word? Just got a word that said, hey, when you're old, you're going to... In other words, I'm not old yet. Peter in jail was going to die the next day, and the angels come and open the gate, the, the door for him, and let him out of jail. Why was he sleeping all night? Because he had a word. When you get a word inside of you that you know that God loves you, and you know that you've got a future, you don't sit back and worry all night long. I'm going to lose my head. Somehow God's going to get me out of this situation. Now, it's in the book of Acts, and the, and the angel comes and opens the door and lets him out. Actually, he had to go back in and grab his clothes because he left without his, his PJs on. Read it. And I, I'm reading this story, and I'm thinking to myself, why does he think that? Because of this. When you get a word, I had a word right after I got born again that God was going to save my mom and dad, my brother, my sister. That was my word. I could have went to heaven after this word was fulfilled. I've often felt like God, God gives everybody here a purpose. He gives all of us an expiration date. He's given us time to do what we're called here to do. And when it's over, it's over. And I don't mean that mean and cruel. But I've, I've taught you, we live well, we die well also. And then when I understood that, I, 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 it was the roughest time of my life, one of the hardest times. I went home, my parents looked at me, and they said, is there any, what, what is it that's going on? And I shared with them about my life and my failures. And, 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 and then tears well up in their life, in their eyes. And I said, and it was a crazy moment. I said, you, would you, Dad, would you like to accept Jesus? Do you know the hardest thing in your life is looking at your daddy? And asking your daddy if he'd like to accept Jesus. To look at your mama and say, Mom, I got to know that when I get to heaven, you're going to be there too. It's hard. It's, it's that pride that wells up inside. Or, or is it the fact that they know all our failures and who we are? And we say, How? I, I can't, I can't, but I got to ask this. And my dad accepts Christ. My mother accepts Christ. My brother accepts Christ. My sister, I baptized all of them. I baptized my nephew, my son. I remember this glorious time in my life. And I sat back and I said, God, and then it was like Acts 16, 31. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your house shall be saved. Now, I know I started with romance here, and I've run all the way down through love, but love is about commitment. Love is about staying the course. Love is about loving him, amen, and doing what he said. And there are times in life, I promise you, you come into this church and you can't say, Jesus, I love you. I like you today. But I've been through a little hell this week. It hadn't turned out the way I thought it would. The stock market took a dip. This happened this week. That happened this week. I like you this week. And he doesn't look at you and go, well, then get on with yourself. No, he looks at you and he says, you know what? I still love you. I still love you. And I want you to follow me. 
Stay with me. It's not always romantic to follow Jesus. You love me more than these? Probably speaking again of the fish. What are these in your life? Can I tell you? you got to love Jesus more than religion. you got to love Jesus more than reputation, occupation, relations. Amen. Jesus kept asking for agape. The sacrificial God's love. Peter kept getting filio, friendship. You know, romance may get you started in life. You know what romance is? This may sound sacrilegious to some of you, but romance is a miracle. When you get that miracle. That, whoo, did you see that? I mean, I have seen miracles. I've seen legs grow. I've seen people get healed, come out of wheelchairs. I've seen the romance like that. But you can't chase enough miracles, romances, to keep you alive in Christ. Eventually, you've got to say, whether I see it or I don't see it, I'm going to serve you. Whether I feel it or don't feel it, I'm going to serve you. I'm committed to you, Jesus. I'm not going to back away. Can I get an amen? Let me pray with you. Follow me is true commitment. With those heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. If you say, Pastor, I'm, I'm void of my walk with Jesus. To be honest, I can't even say that I love him or like him. I need him. I need him in my life. If that's you, would you slip your hand up right now? Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Amen. Anyone else before we pray? Pray this with me together. Lord Jesus, I commit myself, not emotionally, but rationally, to tell you I love you. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Touch my emotions. Help me understand the difference in romance and love. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me ask you a question. Have any of y'all ever had to take a computer class? Lift your hand if you ever took a computer class. All my life, I never dreamed I'd have to take one. And then I started, I always wrote my notes down, just like I write in my Bible. I always wrote my notes down. And there came a time when I realized, I got to figure this thing out because it's not going away. I got to figure out how to work a computer. So I took a computer class, and, and, and it taught me how to boot up the computer, which means turn it on. It changed the name from turning it on to boot it up. And my whole life now has been dealing with computers and learning how to work with them and laptops and oh it's been quite if you're like me it's been an adventure because we started out with them big monsters five thousand dollars you had to save up money to get it amen and then it, and then it downsized got smaller and smaller and now your very phone is a computer if you've got a flip phone in here don't tell no one don't don't even don't even mention it don't even because they, they look at you like you historic or something but i found out that computers or a lot like the romance that you deal with in life. Now, watch this. If you want to install a husband, this was a dear tech support. Last year, I upgraded from boyfriend 5.0 to husband 1.0. And notice a distinct slowdown in overall system performance, particularly in the flower and the jewelry applications which operated flawlessly under boyfriend 5.0 in addition husband 1.0 uninstalled many other valuable programs such as romance 9.5 personal tension 6.5 and then installed undesirable programs such as NBA 5.0 NFL 5.0 3.0 and golf clubs 4.1 also, conversation 8.0 no longer runs. And house cleaning 2.6 simply crashes the system. Please note that I have tried running nagging 5.3 to fix these problems, but to no avail. What can I do? Sign desperate. Dear desperate, first keep in mind Boyfriend 5.0 is an entertainment package. While husband 1.0 is an operating system. Please enter command, I thought you loved me, 
www.tearsix.html and try to download Tears 6.2. Do not forget to install Guilt 3.0 update. If that application works as designed, Husband 1.0 should then automatically run the application's jewelry 2.0 and flowers 3.5. However, remember, overuse of the above application can cause Husband 1.0 to default to Grumpy Silence 2.5. <laughs> Whatever you do, do not under any circumstance install Mother-in-Law 1.0. <laughs> It runs a virus in the background that will eventually seize control of all your system resources. In addition, please do not attempt to reinstall Boyfriend 5.0 program. These are unsupported applications. It'll cause a crash to Husband 1.0. In summary, Husband 1.0 is a great program, but it does have limited memory and cannot learn new applications quickly. You might consider buying additional software to improve memory and performance. We recommend cooking 3.0 and hot lingerie 7.7. .7. Good luck, tech support. If you've never worked a computer, I just taught you how right there. Amen. Stay tuned all week long. We're going to be doing something like this all the way until next Sunday night. Hallelujah. Our servant leaders that come forward. Did you catch all that? Okay, that's good. You're going to need to. You're so faithful. Such a great church. You need to offer an envelope. You know, this is also the, as we shared last week, there are two types of people, givers and takers. Be a giver. Be a giver. And all the things you do in life. Amen. David, as you come. Joseph, glad you guys made it. Amen. You had a little tech support back there, didn't you? Amen. Don't forget, guys, today is the last day to sign up for that Valentine banquet. Again, it's for singles, and, and we're going to just have fun, singles and, and couples. Uh, and, and please let me know. If you say, Pastor, I'd love to go, can't afford it, let me know. Let us know. We have folks that, that love to sponsor because we know what kind of time it's going to be for each other. Amen. Amen. Today, uh, so we have swap meeting, seniors meeting uh, in the fellowship hall afterward. Uh, see Ken and Linda Rich for details. If you guys have any questions, Ken and Linda in the front. Uh, they're an amazing couple, uh, and 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 you guys have fun back there. From what, what what I hear, never been there, but from what I hear, it's a good time, huh? Uh, I don't. Hopefully, I guess. <laughs> from what I hear, uh, getting old is not for the week. So, from what I hear, February 17, Valentine's banquet. It says today, last day to sign up. Again, uh, like Pastor said, if you guys would like to go and maybe can't afford it tell us I'm, we'll make something happen for you guys it's gonna be a good time uh ken holloway is gonna be there uh it's gonna be a good time march 1st uh tlcc ladies ministry friday march march 1st uh save the date for fun ladies game night 7 p.m at new caney so guys uh miss marie i don't know if she's actually made it in oh there she is see her now i was like i know she was here um okay uh see miss marie uh, I, I don't know what they're going to be doing exactly. Games, apparently. So, <laughs> there you go. Fun, fellowship, food. And there you go. That's the three F's that I love. And that's the three F's that we're allowed to enjoy in church. So, <laughs> March 9th. Uh, oh, uh, March 2nd, Daddy-Daughter Dance. Saturday, March 2nd, 5 through uh, 8 p.m., 3 years old to the 5th grade, $15 per adult. Uh, happily ever after Daddy Daughters Dance in the New K Caney Cafeteria. Uh, see Miss Marley for detail. Um, I don't know if we're going to have anything in the back, but guys, uh, if you want to hang out with your daughters, show her what to expect in a man. She's going to learn it from you. And that's one thing, even now, in my daughter, I'm instilling those values. Look, this is what you look for in a man. How do I do that? I buy her flowers. When I buy her mama flowers, I buy JJ flowers. 
to let her know, look, this is what a man should do. Another thing with that, guys, look, I can't tell you how many times I've been in line with flowers and have somebody behind me say, oh, it must be in the doghouse. It's okay to do that without being in trouble, amen? It's good. You know, we can cause some, some romance in our lives every once in a while because of the things we do, it, not just what they do, amen? Uh, March 9th sits uh, stable in the saddle. And I believe that's going to be, does not say, I believe it's going to be in Crosby this time. Um, it's going to be uh, our stable in the saddle. Uh, it, this is a firm foundation course. If you are new in Christ or new to our church and you really want to know what we believe as a church and what pastor really believes, come to this class. You will know exactly what he believes by the time you're done. Not only that, it really gives you a great concept and great understanding and a firm foundation in what you believe. And when you have that, it's amazing what you can say no to and what you'll be able to say yes to in Christ. Because when you don't know, you're just kind of like the song says from Aaron Tip, you're like a puppy on a string, you'll fall for anything. And, and when we first start walking in Christ, if we're not careful, we can be that way. We'll just, we hear somebody on TV and we're like, oh yeah, I believe that. Oh yeah, I believe that. Because we don't know. But this will teach you and it will let you know what you should believe. Not just because he says it, but because he backs it up with scripture. Amen. If somebody says something and it ain't in the word, <laughs> don't listen because it, 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 it's garbage. Amen. So anyway, today we're believing God for jobs and better jobs, more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money. Bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Morning, guys. I'm fine to cough, so I ain't got much of a voice. So I'm just going to play some music for y'all, if that's okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, brother. Let's play, folk. Precious Father God, we do thank you for this house, Father. And yes, Jesus, we do love you, Father. Father God, during this love week, heading up to Valentine's Day, Father God, I pray that we'll each continue working so we can get into heaven, that all-inclusive forever resort, Father God, the one that we do want to spend eternity, and I believe eternity, a long time with our loved ones. Continue watch over your folks until we meet again. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 